Hey YouTube, it's been a while. I am in Denver, Colorado. It is about 6.35 in the morning local time, 5.35 for us folks on the West Coast. You can see the moon there, the sun's just starting to make itself known. It's a little blue behind me. Take a little road trip today to Ray, Colorado, which is almost three hours almost due east of here. It's right on the Colorado Kansas border on the North Fork of the Republican River. Sorry about the light going out. Um, I'm gonna heat up the car, I'm gonna gas up, and I'm gonna head over there. It is the site of what George Armstrong Custer called the Battle of the Great Plains. And I have a personal connection which I will share with you. And uh, I will see you soon. Okay, me again. I've grabbed shelter in the uh, nice uh, relief map and uh, description of the battle. I've walked uh, the entire battlefield. Let's orient ourselves. Here's the monument right here. Beecher's Island is up across towards the far side of that river bridge. And the ridge I was just up on is right there. That's uh, Roman Nose Ridge. So. Let's talk about what happened here. 1867-1868, uh, the American Civil War is over. By the way, disclaimer, I'm not a historian. I'm a history fan. Um, this is information I've gathered. I don't attest to the exact accuracy of anything, but I'm doing my best to tell the events as they occur and not color it either way. Summer of 1867-1868, the frontier of the United States is Kansas, which is that way, due east from here. That's the rising sun. So uh, Kansas is only a few miles from here, uh, maybe 20 or 30, uh, but that at the time, that was the frontier. That was the west of the United States. We had the idea of manifest destiny, and we were gonna, you know, it was our uh, God-given duty to displace the Native Americans and occupy all the way on this coast. But at this point, we'd only come as far as Kansas in terms of actual settlement. The Transcontinental Railroad, came about the same distance. Uh, as we stretched into the Great Plains, we started bumping into Native Americans who can, uh, were understandably not super happy about uh, the white men coming in and, uh, you know, setting up fences and, and growing crops and stuff, displacing the buffalo. So at about this time, 1867, 1868, the Cheyenne Nation split. There was one part which was uh, more inclined to peace with the white man. They moved to the south of this area, or, or the Kansas area to the east of here. And there was another faction that, that was known as the Dog Soldiers. It was several groups of military-based, war-based societies. I mean, that's what they did was they raided, they fought, and, and they attacked. One of their greatest leaders was Roman Nose. He was actually here at this battle. Uh, in any event, summer of 1868, it heated up so much that the governor of, then governor of Colorado, contacted the army and said, uh, hey, I know the 7th Cavalry and the 10th Cavalry, which are stationed about 70 miles from where I'm standing. So uh, the closest military installation to this area, or at least the one that's referred to as Fort Wallace, it's about 70 miles from here. So, uh, since the 7th and the 10th Cavalry, the regular army were so thinly stretched trying to deal with this uh, Native American problem, um, the general contacted his aide from, uh, his trusted aide, he was a, he was a major, um, Forsyth. For, they served together in the Civil War, and he said, let's try something different. We're not going to use regular troops. I want you to find about 50 hardy frontiersmen. They were later called scouts, but uh, they were civilians, and they were paid. They needed to show up with a horse. They were given a repeating Spencer rifle, which at the time was the assault weapon of the day. It was a, for the time, extremely rapid-fire weapon. Fire, cock, fire, cock, fire, cock. I'll get the capacity on that, but it, it comes into play in this battle. So in early September, 
they are charging around Kansas trying to find the Native Americans, but they, they can't catch them. By September 10th, there's a raid near this area. They find out about it. They come here. They camp on the banks of this river on September, the night of September 15th, morning of September 16th, 1868. Unbeknownst to them, about 11 miles upriver are several camps of Native Americans, including dog soldiers, uh, including some Lakotas. And none of the information that I have reveals how the Native Americans knew the scouts were here, but they knew they were here because on the morning of the 16th, uh, Roman Nose had the majority of his uh, warriors concealed over that ridge. They were gonna do a dawn raid. They were gonna stampede the horses. They were gonna kill all of the scouts. And instead what happened was Forsyth himself happened upon or noticed a Native American approaching with, with hostile intent and he shot him and killed him. That woke everybody up. It was about dawn. It was, it was too dark to see. Um, there were 52 Americans down here and within a half a mile, I've heard from 300 to 1,000 uh, angry Native American warriors, uh, many, of, many of them on horseback. So their plan was to come stampede the horses. Uh, that was interrupted. They did stampede the pack mules. That's got all the food and, and supplies in it. That'll come up a little bit later. Uh, Forsyth either ordered or because of the commotion, these guys knew what they were doing. They saddled up their horses. And by then the sun was up enough that he realized there are a ton of Native Americans and they're really pissed off. So he directed them to that island over there. This, there was water in this river. There was a sandy uh, sandbar is what it was, a sandy island in the middle or, or detached from both shores. They rode out to that. He told them to tie their horses uh, to bushes in a circle and they decided they were going to make a stand instead of run for it because they weren't going to be able to run. So uh, the uh, Native Americans had sharpshooters on the ridges. Um, I'm not sure of the exact timing of when the horses bought it, but uh, eventually all the horses were dead. Uh, I think during the initial charge, the American horses were alive and tied up, and Roman Nose and the, uh, a Native American just known as Medicine Man or the Medicine Man um, led the charge. They were just going to ride over the island and just slaughter the Americans. Well, those Spencer rifles came into play because nobody had ever, or certainly the Native Americans had never even seen or heard of a rifle that fired that fast. Normally, you'd ride towards them, they discharge their firearms, and while they're trying to load, you're, you're on them. What happened here was, uh, Major, by, by this time he'd been given a brevet or a field promotion of Lieutenant Colonel, but uh, Major Forsyth had the scouts hold their fire, and then when the Native Americans were very close, he said, now, now, and every man was able to fire several times, seven to ten times, and it just broke the back of the Native American charge because they'd never seen anything like it. There was 40 guys and, you know, well over 200 rounds coming at them in very rapid fire. It was a force multiplier. It's like a machine gun of the day. So at some point in the first day, uh, Lieutenant Beecher, who was the second in command, uh, was killed by a sharpshooter on the ridge, headshot, uh, the island was named Beecher Island, Beecher's Island, and the battle became known as the Battle of Beecher's Island in, in his honor. There's a marker here that I photographed separately. Uh, Forsyth took a round in the thigh, in the leg, broke his leg, broke his upper leg. Pretty serious wound. Um, the horses all died. The uh, scouts started digging behind them. They had a circle of horses, which is essentially sandbags. It's a good bullet stop. They began digging behind the horses inside the circle until they hit water because they're on a sandy uh, 
islet in the middle of a river. They couldn't dig very deep, but they're they're there. So, hey, it's me again. Uh, I really apologize for the wind noise. Uh, a lot of the time, I was able to keep the microphone out of the direct wind, but when I wanted to show something, it gets pretty thunderous. So I want to I want to get some clean audio before I leave here. Uh, I just got back in the car, as you can see, it's it's really cranking, blowing out there. So. Forsyth took around in the leg, which fractured his leg. He took a minor head wound, but he was essentially out of the fighting. It, I mean, his femur was broken. Um, several other men were injured on on the scout side. Roman Nose was blown off his horse by a shot, and the medicine man was, was mortally wounded too. They were laying in the sand, injured on the riverbank, their warriors recovered them, but I know that Roman Nose died that night at about 10 o'clock. Um, during the first day, Forsyth realized this is really bad. There are a whole lot of angry, effective warriors here. We are, we are all going to die here if we don't get some relief. We can't get away. So he called for two volunteers to try to get to the fort, which is 70 miles from here. Uh, two guys stepped up. They crawled, literally crawled, for three miles from here and traveled only at night after that. But they didn't stand up from the crawl for three miles. They made it to the fort in four days. They covered 70 miles on foot, four days. The second day, Forsyth sends two more guys, because he doesn't know if the first two guys are going to make it. All four guys eventually make it. Uh, several units are dispatched using differing routes, because it, this was the Wild West. They didn't know what they were going to hit, or if they were going to be able to get through, or whatever. So, the unit that got here and and assisted the scouts and, and drove off the Native Americans was the 10th Cavalry. Buffalo Soldiers. They provided the relief. They drove off the, the Native Americans and they moved everybody off of that island to fresh air because what had happened in the 10 days, or the nine, they came on the ninth morning, the horses were rotting, the Troops who were who had se severe injuries, their wounds were putrefying. They were bl clouds of black flies. It, the the ill were so ill they just weren't expected to live. Uh, but in reality, four or five days after they got them to clear air, they were well enough to travel, and and the survivors were taken back to the fort where they arrived on September thirtieth, and. Um, one Congressional Medal of Honor was awarded to the commander of the Buffalo Soldiers for saving these guys. Again, it's me. As near as I can tell, this is Beecher's Island, which was named, of course, after Lieutenant Beecher, who was killed in the battle. There, up in there, is that obelisk and the markers that used to be down here, that was put up down here, a couple of years after the battle, but uh, although it's just bone dry right now, apparently this flooded fairly significantly a lot and it carried the basilisk away. They found the engraved base of it, but they never found the upper part, so they had to replace that. And then they moved it above the what they thought was the high water mark so that it wouldn't periodically wash away. And you might wonder, uh, I'm three hours outside of Denver, Colorado. I had, a, I had business in Denver, Colorado this week. I'd always wanted to do this. It's kind of a weird place. I mean, we're literally uh, almost into Kansas from Denver. I've driven all the way across the state. i got to drive all the way back to catch a plane. Why the heck is this guy doing this? Why is he so interested in the battle of Beecher's Island? Well, I'll tell you why. This guy, right here. C. Smith, Chalmers Smith, 
uh, all these guys were from Kansas, but Chalmers Smith, I happen to uh, be related to. That is my, that is my mother's father's great grandfather. So by my math, that is my great 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 grandfather, Chalmers Smith. Survived the battle, wasn't injured, returned here, and was actually instrumental in setting up the first uh, monument, which washed away literally. Uh, this area flooded and something like this was gone when they came back the next year. They found the base. They never found the uh, engraved top, so that had to be replaced. There is a little marker. I photographed it separately, but there's there's a marker right marker right there. That's a high water mark for uh, the 30s, 1935. The water came all the way up to there from this river. I assure you, I just walked all the way across and it is a desert down there now. But this is the North Fork of the Republican River, also known as the Arikari River. This was known as the fight at the Arikari, sorry, Arikari, the fight at the Arikari or the Battle of Beecher's Island. And not much so anyway i have to go catch a flight i have at least a three hour drive back to wonderful denver airport to turn in this fabulous kia rent a car and uh, i'm gonna go home and edit all this and i'll get it up as soon as i can uh thank you for joining me on this i appreciate it um sorry that some of the narration came from the car if that's where it comes from I'm, i'll look at all the footage and if if the uh wind noise is too bad uh this will be the story. Hopefully the other stuff will work. Thank you.